Gone are the days when robots could only execute repetitive and predictable tasks. Today, they're evolving at warp speed, going beyond their program boundaries. Imagine machines that see, learn, and think, fully connected to their surroundings. For a seamless coordination, the virtual twin bridges the gap between humans and machines. They are the eyes on the ground, providing real-time monitoring. Robots learn from their virtual twins to adapt through simulation of their behavior, testing scenarios, and predicting outcomes. In what ways do human-robot collaborations contribute to the augmentation of human abilities? What ethical considerations and safeguards must be put in place to ensure responsible use? What impact does it have on work and how can we prepare for potential societal shifts? Join us for a thought-provoking panel discussion where experts will reveal how robots are stepping out from the shadows of automation. Hello and welcome to the 3D Experience Lab Munich. It's time again for a new edition of our 3D Excite Live panel discussion. Today we are going to dive deep into the topic of the evolution of robots. Actually, they have been around for a while, but you may have noticed that currently they are being pushed to the next level. So, what does this mean for us? The robots are coming, are they? I think AI has a lot to contribute to answer that question. And I think AI will even take center stage in our today's discussion. Believe me, that panel is special in many ways. And I can't wait to see them on stage. But before I do this, let me share a little secret with you. These days, 25 years ago, the company that led into the brand 3D site was founded in Munich, actually not far from here. For us, a time to celebrate. So for everyone on site, let's share a drink later on to all these years. Now, Let's get the panel rolling and invite the person on stage who is going to lead it. And here she comes. Raj. Raj. Hello. 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 Hi. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 3D Excite Live. My name is Raj Heyer, and I'm delighted to be your host again this evening. Tonight, we're talking about the future, beyond automation, the evolution of robots. Now, I love a good sci-fi movie, but this is science fiction in real time. And with AI powering it, robotics is moving forward at a dizzying pace. So what is the human-robot collaboration going to look like? And what does the future look like? Luckily, we have four great experts joining us tonight to have a great conversation about this. Now, if you feel inspired or there's a quote that you want to share, take a screenshot if you're online or take a photo if you're in person. And please share it on LinkedIn. And don't forget to use our hashtag 3D Excite Live. So without further ado, let's get the panel on stage. So first and foremost, we have industry expert, chairman and co-founder of the German Robotics Association, Helmut Schmidt. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Global Marketing Director for United Robotics Group, Sunny Chen. <laughs> Industrial Robotics Specialist for Dassault Systems, Dalmia, we have Alin. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Alin Iadake. <laughs> Got there in the end. Once again. <laughs> and last but not least, we have co founder and product architect for Sam Robotics, Ben Stickelman. Stickelbrooks. I did it again. Hello. Close enough. I did it again. Sit down. All right. And after the initial discussion, we will have time for questions. So please prepare them for our discussion and welcome everybody. Hello, hello. We're going to start with a really easy question. And that is, what drove your love of robotics? And Helmut, why don't we start with you? Um, I had a very good opportunity nine years ago to open up the subsidiary of Universal Robots. Um, and this is the start of the collaborative robots. Four years ago, I was founder of the uh, German Robotics Association. And now I'm an interim manager and startup investor for robotics. And that's what it's all about. Fantastic. Thank you, Sunny. A little bit different. So I actually um, saw in 2010 at Shanghai Universal Expo of like, I think, 20, 30 robots dancing together. And it's coming uh, from a French company called Aldebaran. And six years after, I worked 
and I started my robotics journey uh, actually working at this company. So this is my story was with, with nice robots. dream come true. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Alan. Uh, so actually, my my background is uh, in mechanical engineering, uh, and I was working for uh, for a car manufacturer, um, but I, I got the occasion to see the factory, and uh, I was just amazed by by uh, what industrial automation can do, uh, and. Um, just uh, I did a small side step and uh, got into uh, robotics, into industrial robotics. Small side step. A Just a small one. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And please, Ben. Yeah, well, I've never really lived in a world without robots. So I started working on them in fifth grade in high school and did it all throughout high school. In university, I started working on autonomous motor cars and motorsport mm -hmm. cars. And then I became a robotics researcher and now found my own company in robotics, just say true. Fantastic. You feel every stereotype of a startup founder on know, stage, I know. right? It's awful. <laughs> Never lived without robotics. <laughs> Excellent. So I want to talk about current state, um, where we are today. And of course, we know that industrial robotics has been around for a very long time. And Alan, I'd like you to share what you shared with me regarding how that progression takes place and why industrial? Uh, well, it goes, um, everybody knows about Moore's law, right? Uh, computational. Uh, Power is gonna, is gonna. Some say it's not, it's not yet, it's not still uh, uh, true. Some say uh, it's, it's still true. Uh, but following the Moore's law, uh, industrial robotics evolved. So basically, computational power uh, of humanity increases. Therefore, industrial robots get better and better. Uh, start off small. Uh, just um, robots that are very, very good at a very, very specific task. Uh, and then growing more and more uh, uh, through vision systems, through uh, through uh, more and more information about the world around them, being being able to process more and more information about uh, the world uh, around them. Yeah, they evolve while well, our technology evolves, right? Yep. And Helmut, you shared some fantastic statistics about what's happening with in the world of robotics. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to share that, and then we can ha open up the discussion. Yeah, more than, more than, more than welcome. I mean, there's the International Association of Robotics, and they publish year by year the different, different numbers. It's about the density on how many robots are installed per, per employees. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Germany had the honor to be third ranked. Um, and why is I had the honor? Because it's about just the estimation about 400 um, robots per 10,000 employees. It sounds good, but if you look at number one ranked, which is uh, public of uh, South Korea, it's about ten. Uh, it's about thousand uh, robots, which means almost three times. So, why I'm saying this, we should not be proud and lay back and see. Okay, we are we are good within industrial robots. Mm -hmm. Now we should ask us what to do to get number two, which is Singapore, by the way, or number one. And there are many many topics, how to move forward, and th this, is, this is important. And the second one is also very, very, very important. If you look back, backwards, number fifth is China, and Europe in general grow about 10% 10, 10 per year, last year even 6%, and Germany almost no, uh, no, 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 no increase, but China grew 57% on robotics within one year. Can you imagine? And this is huge, and we can learn from. Okay. So this is basically majority industrial numbers, right? It's mainly on industrial figures, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's what I would say. I would say we should change uh, the metric from ro robots per employee to robots per person. Maybe that's what we should do, you know, get robots into our daily life and away from the factories. And we should definitely try to do our very best at that metric. But then most likely Asia will be even far ahead because social robots <laughs> are, are, are even more employed in, in, in Asia uh, than in Europe. For sure, but that's not a reason not to catch up. <laughs> but that's where it gets a little bit scary or exciting, yeah. depending on which side of the fence that you sit on, right, is this integration into society. How are we envisioning that they're going to enter the ecosystem? And of course, they have in some cases as well. So please share your, your thoughts or examples. Well, uh, I mean, uh, you have, uh, I, th I think the, the first step, let's say, uh, starting from industrial robotics, taking the fences off happened with uh, collaborative robots, right? Mm. Uh, <coughs> which again, it's not, it's not something, uh, we, it's not rocket science. We just, we had the possibility of uh, adding more sensors to them um, and computing all that new information. And we managed to, to get them uh, close and work hand in hand with a, with a human. 
So I guess, I guess that was the first time when, uh, when literally the fences were taken off. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's still within the industry, right? So we're, are we seeing it entering into yeah. the society? And, mm -hmm. and what does that look like? I think it takes, uh, from adoption point of view, change management point of view, and technology advancement as well. Because I, coming from more social robots, um, talking with industrial um, mm -hmm. in front of experts. So from a social side, it's more um, how people accept the robot. So um, with our um, robots, like has been, has been deployed into the society, let's call it public life environment, education, healthcare, for example, has been more than 15 years. So we saw how the design of the robot has played a very important role, for example, for our little robot, the humanoid robot, the same one which I saw like in 2010, still have like huge passion, um, has been in used quite a lot for um, autism kids, for example. Mm -hmm. So we can see the robot actually um, has been perceived by those type of uh, and children, with, let's say, with a, uh, difficulties, like interact with, with human. They feel like the robot is repetitive, with no, there's no judgment. So they can feel like really they can rely on the robot and trust on the robot. So we saw like the kids could not speak, for example. And then after sitting there with the robot, because you can be a very, very, very good like educator. Mm -hmm. But then when you're repeating the same sentence for 100 times, you get tired. You might have a little bit emotion and you cannot feel, feel it. But the kids is very sensitive, but they don't have this kind of situation with robots. So yeah. this is a very good example, like how robot can be used in a social, let's say, way than in the industrial setting. It's still in a controlled environment, right? Because I remember you saying that it's much more difficult to get them out on the street where you've got traffic and dogs and kids running around. <laughs> this is where technology gets <laughs> a, uh, important and uh, difficult because yeah. in the industrial environment, it's very controlled, regulations, safety standard, and then you have to get training to, in order to operate the mm -hmm. robot. But then on the restaurant, in the restaurant or in a hotel, I mean, you have dogs running, kids running, so it's 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 different. Yeah, but not only in in industry. I, I mean, in the in the standard industry, if you go to automotive, you you are right, uh, and this is the heaviest employed robotics industry. But we have so many different problems, and if you look now, even if in in industry, industry on agricultural um, robots or construction robots, so we just passed happily um, um, a corona pandemic, <laughs> but you couldn't find any people for asparagus gripping or for fruit gripping, people went home. Mm -hmm. So the agriculture, and you have a very, very interactive environment, and the same on construction industry. It's almost like in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You don't have a dog or a cat on a, on a construction site, but you have uh, diff different persons run, run, running around. And this is a, a v actually very complex, and this is also, I believe, one of the reasons why industrial robotics implementation is quite easy or very advanced. Logistic is following with e-commerce, but in agriculture and especially in construction, mm -hmm. which is very diverse and very interactive, this is, um, th th this is a big challenge and, and people are not robotic experts, so usability will be key to get a, a, a painter use a robot. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with that point. I think the main driver for adoption of robots will be the convenience and how easy it is to use them. Um, there's many ways that is being implemented at the moment. I do also want to make the point that in order for robots to work for us and help us uh, with what we want to do, we need to invite them in. Um, the same happened also in the factories. A factory, uh, you know, maybe at BMW or Mercedes right now, doesn't look like it did 30 years ago or even 50 before they had the first robots. Um, they changed around them. And we're going to have to do similar things to some degree to really let robots help us because they can provide value for us. And, you know, especially in societies like Western societies, we're going to need all of the help we can get because uh, we will need workforce. Yeah. Now, you talked about AI as well, and we can all jump into sure. this as well, because it's AI and the ability to have a conversation with these robots that's yes. enabling them to be in these places, I would yeah. imagine. So, uh, please, share your thoughts. Yeah, well, I'm just going to go back uh, mm -hmm. yeah. to what Helen was saying, because it's basically a difference between uh, predictable and unpredictable environments, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the automotive is just about planning everything perfectly, doing, checking all possible scenarios, making sure that everything is, uh, is perfect. Mm -hmm. Uh, but once you start uh, interacting with a human, well, humans are unpredictable by nature. Um, and that's why uh, 
That's why we need AI to make the next step. Yeah. Uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's what my company does. Uh, I definitely agree. Um, first of all, humans might be unpredictable, um, but only to a certain degree. I think most of the actual interactions people will have with robots, uh, I wouldn't call predictable, but at least I would call, you know, sort of manageable. Manageable, mm -hmm. right. And um, the thing is, we want to get robots that can work with humans, right? We want to get robots that can mm -hmm. help us out. So they, of course, need to be able to converse with us, right? The language and voice is the natural interface for this, because that's how we communicate mm -hmm. right now. And, you know, a, what AI is doing is helping us bridge that gap, right? Between the formal logic, the formal languages that, you know, drive robots, to the natural language that we speak. This is what AI is doing for us, and is doing for us right now. The best interface is no interface, right? The best interface <laughs> is no interface, but the voice is close as we can get. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. like that. <laughs> but I, I would say yes and no. I mean, this is the technical perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but to make robots working in our uh, environment, or I always saying to democratize robotics, it's all about change and change management. Um, for example, you have a 1 meter 80 robot going to a childcare. Mm. Most likely this won't, this won't work. All the robots you see are small and tiny and good looking. The other <laughs> way around, they would not work in, in industrial. Mm. And when we did the first um, salt robots in industry, and when we failed is when the company couldn't address the employees, that he doesn't take away the job. He mm. helps him to relieve. So it's all about change. It's about, it's, it's an employee. And even at the beginning, they gave a HEV AMR a name or their, the cobot a name to really say, that's, that's, that's my colleague. Mm -hmm. So of course, AI and tool and, 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 and the voice control is a, is, is a huge accelerator. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't chart a change in the mind of a human and a person, mm -hmm. uh, then the collaboration will be complicated. I think you hit on something very important there, and I know, Sonny, you had a thought on this as well, is that we have enough humans in the world, but we do have a shortfall in Europe. So when you talk about it's not replacing your job, this is, of course, yep. one of the biggest myths out there. So I'd love for you guys to jump in on that. Uh, Sonny, do you want to go first? Um, it's, I think it's not replacing. It's more changing the way how we work. It's like by shifting your uh, skills like today to another type of skills. And then I think in the recent, maybe at the beginning of the year, the interview with um, Bill Gates, he mentioned maybe in the future, the human will be work three days per week. Well, I think back maybe 50, 60 or 70 years ago, we work maybe seven days per week. So I think it's more like how do you use the time you can, let's say, um, saved from the automation or AI to do something useful. So I, I watched a uh, um, research paper from a Stanford University. They have a study on a general generative AI versus human. So they gave them uh, exactly same questions, challenges, and then they compare, like yeah. what is the differences? So they compare two things. So first the novelty, and second is the efficiency. So you can see from the efficiency side, AI for sure go. <laughs> it's not like, a huge gap, but you can see, yeah. uh, like, still there is a gap. But the human, for sure, novelty, creativity, it still um, goes mm -hmm. higher. This is why I come back to what you said, like, human, maybe a robot will help human, but I think human still needs to be in control. Human needs to be in control of AI, of mm -hmm. robots, because by the end, they're sharing the, the collective intelligence, I mean, for all of robots in the future, if they're sharing AI, as you can see from Nivida, um, like, you know, the conference recently mm. talking yeah. about the Groot, it's like, how can we create AI aim for generative for all robots? By the end, they share the same knowledge. But you, I mean, we have five here, I'm sure we're not <laughs> thinking about the same thing, right? So coming from <laughs> different culture, different background, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But I do want to make a point there, because I do think this is one of the biggest misconceptions, and we do see it now um, with, uh, with, the recent, uh, with the recent publications by NVIDIA, for example. Um, there's a different nature to artificial intelligence to natural intelligence we have. Mm -hmm. And I think a big understanding is trying to make, like for example in that study, trying to make the AI do what we do. And there is no point in that, because the AI is better at, things, at different things than us. And it's similar for me with robots. Why do we make robots like humans? 
they can do other things. They can do things better than we do. And the human body is not perfect. There's no, there's no point in making a robot that's exactly like a human. There's a point in making a robot that is very different or a little different and can do certain tasks better. And I think that's what we need to focus on. Yeah. I would like to jump in on that point because that, that was something that one of you said to me that was very interesting is that they need to be non-threatening, right? They like you said, in industry, you need them to be large enough to do the task. But if they're going to be in society, they need to be small and unassuming. And as a woman or as mm. somebody who might feel threatened by a <laughs> six-foot robot that could throw you through a wall. I've watched too many sci-fi movies. Um, <laughs> you know, th there is something to that, though. It's that Uncanny Valley issue, right? Yeah. So, Helmut, you were going to um, jump in. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you, you were saying about what, what, what's the, the robot changing. I mean, mm -hmm. we have a, a famous uh, news, newspaper, um, and they, in the 60s, the headline was Robots are destroying workforce, 1960. The same was 1980, the same <laughs> was 2000. Um, and nowadays, I'm, I'm a, a, a baby boomer, uh, which means in 2030, and this is six, six years from uh, 2030, yeah, six, six years from now, in Germany, we'll, we will miss six million worker, educate worker, mm -hmm. educated workers. So the question about a robot is destroying a person uh, is just is just nonsense. I mean, if we need to invest in education, uh, we need to invest in getting people from abroad to 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 Europe or to to Germany. Uh, but the gap on six million people you cannot solve by immigration or by education. It's only can be solved by by, by robotics, by automation. So it's out of discussion. And of course, it's it's a help. And what we, you just mentioned it, a robot can different task, uh, but we have uh, sensibility, capacity, and, and the, ro the robot is fast, strong, so mm -hmm. and let him do the, the, the stupid, repetitive task. Mm -hmm. And that's what a robot is better than, than, than we, eight hours a day. So I, I, per I just came from, 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 from a fair. Uh, very typical is a... Uh, and end of line packaging or pelletizing. Mm -hmm. And if you imagine you standing there, most likely eight hours a day, at the end of the day, she was shifting, you would have shifted two tons mm -hmm. monotonously. I quit the job. Yeah, and, 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 and <laughs> quit the job. Fed, how, 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 how stupid <laughs> is this? I will go and for medical insurance for working incidents. Ex exactly. <laughs> and, and on the other side, maybe on administration, they're looking heavily to find a person to do the job. So why not transfer the person from here? Then, of course, we need mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. from a stupid, repetitive task to where people is better. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's what we focus on. Go ahead. Okay, but are we ready as a society to, uh, to absorb that? Uh, Humans don't like change. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and it's not only that, but you also have the transportation uh, that, that might uh, have a lot of autonomy. Uh, and it's like, I don't know, I, th I think it was like 10%, at least in the US, 10% of the workforce uh, works in transportation. So what happens when tomorrow you'll have 10% uh, of the work wor workforce uh, jobless? What do you do then? Can you really absorb 10% uh, of the workforce and retrain them? into something. It's uh, going to be a gradual process, isn't it? Yeah, not not okay. 10 million yeah. jobs the, are going to die overnight. Phase, That's not how yes. it's going to work, yeah. is it? Okay. So I think um, it big changes to our society are coming, but they're yeah. always coming. So there's no point in fretting about it. We have to stay positive and, you know, look towards the future with a little bit of optimism. I know in Germany it's hard. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah. you know look, try to look towards the future with optimism because um, at the end of the day, we're transforming society every day. And, you know, let's try to make it something better than it was before. And yeah. sitting eight hours in a truck isn't necessarily, yeah. you know, the I best way to spend your life either. So we can, yeah. you know, we can go somewhere else, somewhere different. And we can make that happen. I think we can lay the foundation for that right now. And we should. Yeah. And I believe new technology just accelerates new, new jobs. Before the mobile phone c came, no one were talking about apps. Now it's a whole new community and earning a hell of money just programming and doing apps and different stuff. But now, within one and a half year, AI is booming. So it just creates new, new jobs, new opportunities, different, different. So I, I'm not afraid at all. Okay. New threats mm. also. Mm. My, my, <laughs> advice Maybe some threats, my advice to you is if you have a robot, insure them. 
<laughs> buy insurance for them. I'm not joking. But did you see there was a they, uh, Deutsche Bahn bought a spot to um, watch yeah. out for graffiti. Uh, <laughs> and that was on Monday they announced it. On yesterday I saw TikTok that it already, already had been vandalized. So what you're saying is correct. There, you know, there will be changes and I think people will also react badly to them. There's also a fact. So... Um, not everybody's gonna like robots, I can tell you that much right now. <laughs> so buy insurance for them, but you know, make them happen. Okay. I think the process is like last year. Um, I'm just from AI point of view, so my team right now, I mean, they prompt, they do a lot of things with, with generative AI. It's mm -hmm. just you can see the efficiency of the work that we're doing. But come back to how can people start like robot, right? You mentioned like they should not be like exactly like a human. So you have this new, no humanoid shape to this humanoid shape. So I think it's depending on where you place this robot and you can choose which scale you should go from no humanoid to humanoid. But <coughs> then th that is the right way from design point of view. You're already making people started to accept it at first step, because if you hate it, you don't want to even use it, right? And then uh, you started to show maybe uh, the real efficiency, the real, let's say, benefits out of it. And then step by step, people will start to, to accept it. For sure, to changing like a leap from like, I have my driving work and then tomorrow I lose my job. It's unacceptable so there is a phase and transition phase so i think it's our job to make sure how we design a robot make it easy to use not just from design external design point of view, from software point yes. design point of view people are starting to use it accept it and uh, get used to it and then we will really yeah. and then prepare it. society for the <laughs> <laughs> replacement but of there's a lot of work to be done in this area i agree but I, the work is starting right now. I mean, everybody who's putting AI onto robots, we're just getting started. Some people like to do it on humanoid robots, okay. We like to do it on service robots, but there is a lot of work to be done and there's so much more to be done, right? We can go uh, even further than AI, right? We can have emotions in, in robots, right? You know, people have figured out how to draw emotions for ages, right? There's been comic strips and Disney has, you know, made movies for 100 years. We know how to create emotion. And there's no reason why we can't do it on the robot. And I agree that if humans are to accept robots as a part of their everyday life, they need to be as uh, the bridge between them, right? The communication needs to be as familiar to them as possible. And that also goes from beyond voice to, you know, body language and, uh, yeah. and emotions like that. But that's not something that's impossible. That's something that we need to work on, um, but where we need to go now. I mean, there is the fact of the economies of scale. It's not cheap to put robots out there, is it? No. I mean, Alan, I think you mentioned <laughs> nope. this when we spoke last. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, economy of scale, yeah. I mean, Helmut knows very well that in industry, uh, you're looking at a return of uh, investment. Yep. You're always going to look on that. Uh, and before we start deploying uh, robots everywhere, uh, doing multiple uh, well, service jobs or any kind of mm -hmm. other job, People are going to look at the, the ROI, and it's it's not only that. It's uh, well, how are you going to produce them? Because <laughs> uh, well, we we have also climate change knocking at our door, uh, and are we are going to be able to produce uh, entire fleets of robots in a in a uh, sustainable way or not? And Those we're not accepting them. I think you mentioned there was an example. Sorry, but Ahmed. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go but, ahead. But, but but it's also a question on. Um, regulations mm -hmm. and and, requi mm. and requirements and we are Germans, of course, are always good in <laughs> regulations <laughs> and, <Very> and norms <laughs> and what, 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 whatever. <laughs> and, and this is um, a limitation and 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 the bottle and the, the bottleneck. Yeah. Um, I just mentioned the number of South Korea as as an example, and the number is so high because the uh, the politicians reduced the regulations to make mobile last mile delivery robots the same um, acceptance as a human walking on, on a street mm -hmm. and not the safety regulations. Uh, if I'm in Japan or in Singapore and I go on a train station, all is safe. If I go in Germany on a train station, on a S-Bahn, a, a high train passed by with 200 kilometers per hour, and no one says, oh, that's, that's, that's fine because you train, don't, don't move there. But in, in industry, uh, we are to totally different perceptions on what is risk mm -hmm. and what is not. And that's the same like um, you, you, you put a, a chicken in a boiling water, and you just 
start boiling, he doesn't feel it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you put him in a boiling, it's different. It, and that, that's a different perspective. And I think we need to, we, we need to change this. Yeah. On safety, I mean, of course, there should be no risk, there should be no insurance, um, but it's a question, do I need a helmet, a, a glasses, <laughs> and, and a security belt? Yeah. Please. Feel free. I don't think robots are that dangerous. <laughs> At least there is robots. Have you not seen Terminator? I have seen Terminator, <laughs> but, um, you know, have you seen Wally? -E? Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Which one do we believe? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, Eve is nice, so, you know, yeah. let's build more Eves. She can't really hurt you. Um, and I think the robots that we're going to have walking around the train stations are going to be more like Eve and less than Terminator. But there has to be ethics around it. There has to be regulation yeah. around it, right? I mean, that's just... Uh, we we're have such a debate about AI. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There will be regulation. <laughs> exactly. But then that could stop innovation. So yes, what I are agree. your thoughts we need to, on this? We need to not let regulation come in the way of having you know, companies in Germany try to put them somewhere. And that's a huge risk. It has happened to other, uh, you know, has happened to other industries in Germany. Um, because there are going to be countries who are going to be more lenient or more optimistic towards the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it is a huge risk. But then again, I don't see the safety risk of service robots as a time that we are going, you know, beyond automation in this talk. So, you know, the, the power and the force of a, you know, huge industrial robot arm is, of course, huge. But a small service robot is essentially, you know, as dangerous as a bicycle. Yeah, but yeah. finally, it's, as you mentioned, it's about ethics. And most robot manufacturers signed the ethic code of conduct for robotics. Mm -hmm. Um, not, not, all, not, not all of them, because nowadays, of course, dual, dual use are coming more popular. And uh, you, of course, if you talk about robotics, you see the fighting robots, you see whatever. So there, there's a, 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 small, a small line on yeah. what a robot should do, can do, or maybe should not do. And this is more about not regulations, it's about ethics, mm -hmm. um, how to do it. And so I think this is very important. Mm -hmm. And also in, 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 in social in environment, mm -hmm. how to see also ethics, I think. That, that's yeah. the main, main driver for the yeah, future. I, I agree. I think it's very important, but come back to regulation. I think service robotics can be dangerous <laughs> from technical point of view, you know. It's like if I have an arm, if I, uh, there is no like, safety regulation before you produce the robot and you don't know like uh, when should I, if I'm holding a li knife, you know, those kind of safety functions, like if there is a kid, I'm just, you know, doing something and then those kind of things should be written into the regulation. I agree with you, example. we should embrace <laughs> the, we should embrace <laughs> some of this robotics. So it's more like a tragic accident to me, but I mean, <laughs> you're, you're not wrong. But the, safe, no. <laughs> <laughs> the safety regulation, I think it's very important for yeah. service robotics, as long as you have it correctly, in the right weight, I think that's mm -hmm. the way how people can accept it, because if you like, be everything, every robot is good, I don't think people are going to accept okay, it. I'm going to stop trust, you there. Trust yeah. is important. We talk about yeah. trust. But the, Alan, you brought up an exceptional example in the United States of how things weren't being accepted. And I'd love you to share that. Ah, uh, yeah, there was um, actually there were quite a few uh, last mile delivery robots that were set on fire and uh, destroyed by the public. Yeah. And that's uh, a delivery insurance, robot. I told you. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> why we're in insurance. Um, and yeah, that's just, just a fear of. Uh, fear of change, fear of uh, jobs being lost and so on. Mm -hmm. But the and same happens to scooters. If you go to the ESA and <laughs> see how many scooters yeah. lying in the ESA <laughs> or bicycles, it, it's sometimes just the habit of a, of, a, of a human to destroy some... You don't think it's more than technology. just vandalism? So, sometimes so no substrate? Sometimes it is. But I saw some videos kicking the robot. Of course <laughs> it is. Uh, but this is about change. Uh, again, coming back to it's change, to make, change. People, mm. to make people aware that this is... He, he's helping each... He's finally helping. I mean, because I laying back in the United States, calling Domino Pizza and asking, what the hell, why the robot is not coming? Or why is my pizza not coming? Oh, maybe someone kicked my robot and therefore the pizza is not coming on automatic. <laughs> or or drone, drone delivery. I, I mean, we, we just need to see about the, the, positive, uh, the, the positive things uh, mm -hmm. thing, things about. And what you said about regulations or about, uh, about danger with the knife, um, of course, there should be not, not happen any, any injurious or even death yeah. people. But if you see, especially in automotive industry, 
why a person was hurt or a person died, he didn't die due to the robot, mm -hmm. because he died because a person yeah. manually put out all the safety mm -hmm. regulations to put into a robot cell and make the programming. Um, but then say, ah, oh, the robot killed the person. No, mm. uh, the person did, or the, the, the human did something yeah. which was not allowed to do. Actually, I want to jump into the 3D experience platform because we talked a little bit, a couple of us, mm. about how you can simulate yep. what could happen in real life or in industrial. Does that help matters? Absolutely. Does that, yeah, so please. Well, uh, I mean, Delmia Robotics just... Uh, uh, in Delmia Robotics, which is on the 3D Spirits platform, uh, well, it's, it's basically an offline programming uh, software. You're probably familiar with those. Uh, it allows you to, to create a virtual twin of the factory, mm -hmm. uh, and there you can uh, run all the, all the simulations you want, all the scenarios you want, and avoid that kind of situation. Uh, human error, you mean? Uh, human error. <laughs> no, human error is quite... It's, <laughs> It's so hard to avoid. Humans will find a way to do, a, yeah. <laughs> to do the wrong so. thing. Uh, that's why we're unpredictable. Right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's it just it just uh, it's a perfect environment. Nothing can go wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and and this is why it's been used uh, in uh, in industrial robotics for a long time. This kind of yeah. technology. So it reduces that fear of the unsafe and unethical, etc. It can help. Yes, it can but, help. but it's, it, yeah. yes, I, I, I'm I, I'm a big fan on. Uh, on, on, on testing like a digital twin. Of course, one is the safety, but the second, especially if you talk about startups, mm -hmm. is about speed, safe cost. Same I mean, time. I need to make yes. prototypes, first prototype, second prototype, what tenth sub prototype. Within a few minutes, maybe in a few months, I can simulate all the mm -hmm. mechanics, electronics, software, so to, to get um, technology faster to the market to lower cost mm -hmm. simulation is is, is, key. is, is key mm -hmm. and even a step further if i am a a customer and i go on a platform and i would like to buy a a, a robot and i believe still to democratize it's about to do it yourself mm -hmm. um like going to a a hypermarket or convenience buy store and mm -hmm. buy the robot um, but before buying, I maybe should simulate the robot at my home or mm -hmm. at my own company. And if this is possible, mm -hmm. um, a HEV, a robot arm, whatsoever, simulate, then, then finally I go there, buy the robot, and he makes cooking <laughs> dishes, <laughs> which is actually very famous in Japan already, yeah. in, in Italy. So cooking. Is this your future. ideal future for the robots is that they cook for you? <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Maybe yeah. more cleaning than <laughs> cooking. <laughs> I just wanted to say because uh, that's one of the uh, cool things about our uh, our software. It's you can use uh, any robot you want. Uh, it's a robot agnostic, and mm -hmm. it's actually yeah, yeah exactly that. You you promote the idea of choosing any robot you want. Excellent. Yeah. So what does that future look like? I mean, Sunny, do you have some ideas about what you'd like to see coming into the well, future? <coughs> since we're talking about beyond automation, uh -huh. so I would take a step um, back because we're talking about how different scenarios we would, would like um, in after we mm -hmm. go to the society. I want to talk about this. The simu I think simulation is very, very important for education, even before they go to, because they were talking about how robots should be simulated working into our environment. But we saw not every school has access to see how by a robot, to mm -hmm. see how the robot can be helped the students to um, train their programming or other skills that they can use in a future society. So if you can have this kind of simulated environment mm -hmm. to show them how they can really use the robot or working with the robot or, I don't know, interact and work for or work on, I mean, not for. <laughs> robots should be working for humans. <laughs> <laughs> good catch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the simulation could play yeah. a good role, make sure the accessibility of uh, this type of education on the robot can get larger, so I would uh, take another side um, perspective looking at the education side. Okay, mm. almost like social to industrial kind of thoughts. Mm. Uh, what are the, your thoughts on the future? Um, We've got another minute before questions. So I would like to see robotics made easy, right? Mm. I would make, like to see make accessible for everybody. I mean, we talked about this, we both agree that in order for robotics to become extremely general, to be placed in every environment, it needs to have AGI, which we're not sure if that's possible mm. or not. But with what we have right now, um, we can give people the ability to let robots into their business, into their retail store, into their restaurant, mm. and work for them 
as soon as possible, right? Make it easy for them and make it easy for the customer to talk with them. Let them teach stuff, let them remember stuff. That's what I would like to see. Easy views, yeah. Exactly. Alan. Well, uh, I hope we don't lose the uh, human touch uh, <laughs> because, uh, I don't know, I mean, th th this, why, this is why uh, up until now we had uh, the robots in the factory, right? The factory is not really made for a human. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a nasty environment, it's, uh, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know, I, I would like to, uh, to have a human nurse and a <laughs> human waiter. Um, and yeah. I hope we still have place for humans to do that. And, uh, okay, let's, if, if let's not come back to that because we're going to take some questions okay. and maybe this will, one of the questions might be around this topic okay. as well. So why don't we take a question else? Do we have anything from online? Of agreement uh, between, uh, between the people online uh, themselves and also with what's been said on the panel. Uh, first question, uh, what happens when these robots are connected to the internet, become older and not up to date? What is the safety risk there? Who wants to take it? I think we have a pretty good <laughs> idea of how to make robots safe even when they are connected to the internet. Um, the, I think when robots are connected to the internet, it only has benefits, right? We have a lot more knowledge that we can access. We have a lot of other potential, um, you know, machines we can talk to, right? So I think it's a net benefit to connect them to the internet and making internet access safe. There's parental restrictions already in your iPhone. Like <laughs> they don't work so well in some really? cases, but yeah. Really? Because, <laughs> because, because you have some children are better than robots. They are, <laughs> they are smarter than robots. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to add to that? Are we good? Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Fine. Well, let's take another question. Anybody in person who's got a question? Fabulous. We've got a mic coming to you. Thanks for an interesting discussion, everyone. Uh, I would like to highlight the uh, environment around the robots. So the infrastructure, basically, right? So and how it would influence not only the adaptation, but also um, how you have to plan for it in general. So imagine I would have a bus and cab road in my cities, right? Why not for um, autom uh, autonomous driven cars? So in house, why wouldn't I elevate my cupboards so someone can clean under it, right? So if my drones deliver packages, it will be dropped on top. So I need a box on top, and then how does it get down? So shouldn't we connect the adaptation of robotics also to the development of infrastructure? Because it has to go hand in hand. So to anyone that wants. Yeah, yeah no, Alan just right we, we were, uh, No, because we were talking at lunch about, uh, he was saying, uh, why not have a robot with three hands? Well, there, there's kind of your answer. Because already you have infrastructure that is adapted for, uh, for humans. Yes. So I agree. but another hand would be useful, which is why we were critiquing why, we were critiquing why the humanoid robots were exactly like humans, when they could uh -huh. be more useful. Yes. Um, but yes, I agree, but also I think this is a great point you're making that, and we, know, we were talking about this earlier on the house side, yes, that we need to invite robots in, right? For them to be really useful, we need exactly what you're saying. Let's maybe lift up the cupboard so they can get under, um, invite them into our homes, in our restaurants, and they will be useful for us. I love that immediately everybody talks about cleaning under because everyone's got those little... Well, yeah. <laughs> How many, but, did you have something but, to add? Yeah, but, but I believe this is not only about uh, the, the, the cleaning robots. It's, yeah. it's the same about industry robots itself. So today a person is doing a job and I would like to make the job done by a robot. So if I get the person out and the mm -hmm. robot in, most likely 50% will fail because the process is done Designed. for a person and it's not done for a robot. Or the same is for an AGV. So definitely, if a robot, and if you talk about democratized robotics, the environment, the processes need to be changed and adapted in different thinking. Otherwise, we will th this will fail. And this is why we need to focus as well as on, on human yes. aid robots. They already, they're, they should have the same uh, design as us. So. Yeah. Interesting. We're very I inefficient agree. machines. <laughs> we're, we're extremely yeah. inefficient hey, machines. We, Isn't that we, the problem? We are experts at yes. stairs. We are very good at stairs. Yes, we're extremely good at stairs. <laughs> but is that, isn't that and the problem that we're stairs. inefficient? You know, we're biomechanical, we're inefficient. If you look at humanoid robots that are out now, they have a very, very short battery life. Battery life isn't going to just 10 times overnight. So, you know, is it worth 
trying to get some technology in that's maybe far away in the future? Or is it worth you know, maybe trying to change what we have around us to make robots possible well, now? Changing uh, <laughs> the infrastructure of the whole world might have a small <laughs> cost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just but I'll, I'll do the math. I actually, yeah. I'll I actually do think the math. developing batteries is harder, but OK. okay. We'll, we'll do the math. For the yeah. We like to go slowly, humans in general. <laughs> do we have another question from online? I would like to share an idea that was shared online and get your insights on this. Okay. Uh, governments could tax robots at the same rate they would have taxed a human resource, and then that revenue could be used to generate a universal basic income. Ooh. Oh, UBI. What are our thoughts there? UBI, well, we yes. don't want to create a robot monarchy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I mean it, it's many it's, it's many times uh, discussed, and as long I'm mean, there two two there are two there are two sides. So if you start now, which was out of my perspective, fortunately not not allowed on the on the European uh, regulation. One of the few uh, few decisions were good, but this was about 95, uh, 49 percent to 51. It's about texting working robots <laughs> mm. and if we put taxes on a working robot maybe this won't work maybe we get the money uh, for for supporting but we need to find different regulations because if you tax this industry will not use this mm -hmm. and finally it's it's always about cost and productivity if it's at home if it's a social robot if it's a hospitality if it's an elderly if they can't afford the robot then they take a person with lower mm -hmm. with lower payment. So finally, it's always about return of invest and, and about cost. Yeah. So taxing would be the one. But to find a way how to make it, why not? I, I think definitely. Uh, yeah, I think we should be open. But at this stage, you don't tax your refrigerator at home. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it does somehow uh, automation work, and you don't tax your car. So yeah. Yeah. I think we need to find. We're yeah. we are not there yet. Uh, I think we are still still learning, trying to find the best solution. But at this stage. We are even looking at today, for example, delivering robot in a restaurant, for example, and we have one case specifically in a hotel, and the one robot was used only 1.5 hours per day, and it's carrying 300 kilograms of dirty dishes. Can you imagine it's how many distance, how many work for service worker carrying that, mm -hmm. and what kind of pain for of, of muscles he, she or her, he is gonna get? Yeah. And they still have their job, I mean, it's just, and then you tell them, yeah, now we are mm -hmm. going to ask your robot to, to pay the tax. Yeah, like, the incentive to put them in place would be yeah. drastically mm -hmm. reduced. Um, another question from the audience at all? Yes, we've got one at the back. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, I would like to know, in your opinion, how ready are we for robotics, especially in Germany, and to keep it simple, just in scale from 1 to 10? Yeah. So let's go. I, 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 I would say, to be, to, to be honest, <laughs> In Germany, we are not ready for, for, mm -hmm. for robotics um, because most of the time we are, uh, we are still negative, maybe not in the industrial robotics, but especially in the service and social robotics. Um, there's where Asia, if you go to Japan or China or South Korea, it's much more advanced. And this is where change and open communication need to, need to happen. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's happened what, what you said, kick the robot and destroy mm -hmm. them. Um, so we, we need to we, we need to learn, but we need to yeah. be open on this. But I, I we are still not ready. I, that's, that's my personal. This comes from your from your, from your industrial mindset, I think. Maybe because you gotta you gotta see it work. You gotta see uh, mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta actually see that the value being delivered. You gotta see all the way to accept it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like industrial mindset. Yeah. We have conducted one survey uh, to just come out actually uh, to. Uh, one month ago. So we did this um, for 2,000 people per country. We did in five countries. That doesn't include Asian countries. We did three, uh, three countries in Europe, so including Germany, France, Italy, and then and Canada and US from mm -hmm. North America. And then we are asking them, how are they seeing robots? And do they accept? Mm -hmm. And specifically in the public life environment and in education. And we see, unfortunately, Germany is the lowest one. <laughs> and Italy, yeah, rank is highest, right? Just a little bit, sometimes kind of in average with US. So it's it's quite interesting, but yeah. I think you are not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the honest data-driven analysis <laughs> there. Um, and we have another question. Huh? 
This is great. Um, Good question. You mentioned robotics and autism treatment. So I would like to know a little bit more about this, if you have some information. So robotics and autism. Oh, autism. 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 Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's so um, we have <coughs> been working on this for um, more than 13 years, 15, 15 years. So this specific robot ha has been and used quite a lot in different actually institutions. There are quite a lot of scientific papers have been written by universities and uh, third party uh, institutions. It's been proved actually um, by using adorable design, humanoid robot really creates this link, emotional link and empathy, empathy between actually the autism kids and the robot. So we see really a big increase in that part. So um, I just want to understand what do you want to know exactly is like it to, to getting some facts or <laughs> is it quite large actually? <coughs> I have a family member who has autism and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for us it's quite hard to find treatment for him here mm -hmm. in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if robotics would be <laughs> something that... Well, then you should get in <laughs> <my> contact <laughs> so we can discuss this offline and then... Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I nice. mean, you gave a great example and it was for the elderly and for autistic children. I also have a mm -hmm. nephew who has challenges and it's, it's about this, you know, as a parent too, you, you're emotional and you have, you lose patience and, and you know, eventually you'll yes, lose patience. And I loved your example because mm -hmm. you're like, there's no judgment. Yeah. There's no, there's no time issue, right? Mm -hmm. It's, they can just listen. Yeah, and then you, you yeah. had an example that you it's, shared. It's yeah. very, very touching because you, you can see that the kids started to smile. Mm. And then the robot is like this and the kids like ear, eye. The moment when you see that, it's, mm -hmm. and you feel like, oh, it feels so good to work on robotics. Yeah, because really? you, yeah, you said like it took 30 minutes of one, one example, right? Yeah. Before they started talking to the robot. Exactly. But then they did. Yeah. Yeah, that's mm. emotional. That's it wonderful. Is. It's it is. great. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Yeah. And please do get in touch with Sunny. We'll make sure. <laughs> after, yes. It's hard to come back to technology after those emotions. But uh, no, I think uh, we have seen that AI and the evolution of robots is tightly coupled, right? I mean, uh, we have all seen the uh, NVIDIA conference on Monday where robots were on stage and so on. We talked a bit about uh, this, like it needs a couple of more breakthroughs, something like battery life and, 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 and you know, those kind of things. What are the breakthroughs required to really change the game here? Is that, I mean, AI obviously changed a lot, right? And making them smarter and, you know, in conversation and what, what other breakthroughs have to happen until we really, you know, cross, uh, cross the point here? Who would like to take that? I know you guys have some ideas, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I mean, obviously there's quite a few things that have already happened, which mm -hmm. we um, can use, for example, AI. Um, I'm not sure if there's any breakthrough waiting to happen. I think we need to be uh, realistic about what we have already and what we can do with it. There's been a lot of talks about OAI, does it have an understanding of the world, does it have a world model? I'm actually of the opinion that it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. we know what it can do for us. It gives computers some kind of an intuition and there's a lot you can do with that. And I think we should be productive with what we have. Having said that, I think um, it will take a while, but the results that we have seen in text uh, and, and the processing of text will for sure happen at some point to, um, to video and images, um, although it will take quite a while because it's computationally a lot more expensive mm -hmm. and expensive literally because those chips don't exist yet and they need to be made and you need to buy 10,000 of them and then you know have a data center. Um, but for sure, that's where we're going. And yeah, battery life will also be great, but I don't <laughs> think... A battery breakthrough is about to happen. They've been yeah. doing that for like 30 years. So, yeah. But is that not a good thing? Because then the technology is increasing as we're starting to adapt them and therefore we can get comfortable with them. I mean, Absolutely. seems logical. I, I believe technology is increasing. But what also happened in technology, it's about fake and fake news. What, <laughs> what I'm saying or what I mean with this is there are dedicated topics a robot can do. And if... There are some persons around are saying, what my robot can do, and you see the videos and you just see, holy shit, this is fake. This is not what a robot can do. And this is um, giving the wrong pers perspective. 
Um, and of course, it's a bad image to to the to the to, to to the environment only because someone maybe says, "Well, I'm so cool and my robot can something like this." But this is reality, and this is about change and per perception. Uh, and um, AI did so much only within one and a half years, so I cannot imagine what's upcoming the next five years. So therefore, the question: what, What's the breakthrough? I, I, I don't I, I don't know. There will be so many. But just say we should stay on what's today possible, and if we have a break, uh, a, a through break, then it should be a real one, not, not a fake one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what? Mm. He, he, uh, yes, I, I have a personal opinion on that. <laughs> 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 so we talk about infrastructure, infrastructure regulation, um, perception, adoption, and uh, I think from technology point of view, me, myself, I feel like the generative vision will be something really like for vehicles as well. Once you know you have a better perception, you can make robots do so many things and without consuming so many energy. So, I mean, it's not like breakthrough, breakthrough, but if we can get there, mm -hmm. I think that would be the next technology leap. And that's my personal opinion. Fantastic. Well, that was all our time for questions. So now I'm going to bring it back to the panel. And I'd love if you give us a couple of statements that you would like the audience to take away. And you do have time. So if you've got a message to get out there, I think we already heard a little bit of it. Don't be scared. But uh, starting with you, Helmut, why don't you tell us what you would like to see the audience take away? Um, the main topic is just, just be open. Don't be afraid. See the positive side. And especially see the robot is helping and supporting us in different topics. If it's at home, where you already have your vacuum cleaner, and this that's where you say, oh, that's that, that's cool. <laughs> but also at work, yeah. social environment. So be open. I think this will be a very good time. And as I mentioned, 6 million people we will miss in 2030 without robots won't solve the problem. Fantastic. Thank you. Funny. Um, I would say em embrace it today and prepare the next generation for the future because it will be so different. And the, our educational system today is not fit for that. So It's not fit for adoption or...? For the future mm -hmm. because, I mean, what they are learning at school today, it's not, they, mm -hmm. they cannot go. So I think it's like embrace ourselves. <laughs> But, uh, you know, for preparing the, the, the next generation for the future. Excellent. OK, thank you. Alan. Uh, well, I think we're, uh, like as a collective, as a humanity, we're, we're stepping into uh, interesting times, that's for sure. Um, and it happened before, for example, with, uh, with social media. Um, it, it came into our lives and changed them for the better, for the good, for, for the worse. Um, and that happened as well because of uh, lack of regulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, sin since we see this exponential growth uh, in AI, we should, uh, we should try and keep up as humanity, not to take the back seat as we did uh, with other things. And, and that we talked about uh, UBI. Um, OK, there are 6 million jobs. There are probably more worldwide that, that are not covered by humans nowadays. There is a lack of, of human force. Mm -hmm. But once we, we go above that, that demand that needs to be filled and can be filled by robots, once we go above that, we should be prepared society to, 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 uh, to take care of us ourselves, really, to take uh, care of humans. Yeah, uh, do the more interesting jobs. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, I would say, yeah, look towards the future with optimism and not skepticism. Um, yeah, to the audience, invite the robots in, you know, make them comfortable. <laughs> the services that they offer and the data that they generate, we need. And I mean, towards the industry, let's, you know, let's make robots easy to accessible to everybody and, uh, and work towards a future where they can help us alleviate those issues. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panel. Thank you to our uh, team behind the scenes, the technical team who always do a fantastic job. Thanks to 3D Experience Lab for the fantastic venue. Um, thank you to our illustrious panel, our audience for the questions, and also a special shout out to Michaela and Els, who are the magic team behind the Get This Done. <laughs> and stay open, because the robots are coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>